Hi, my name is Tony, and today we're going to be looking at using Fusion inside of DaVinci Resolve. Now, the purpose of today's video is to give you a good understanding of how to use Fusion. Take a look at the interface and do some simple compositing and set some keyframes so that way you can be on your way to creating composites and visual effects inside of Resolve. All right, with that in mind, let's take a look. Okay, I'm in the Resolve Project Manager. Now, I'm going to right-click and select Restore Project Archive. We want to go to the quickstart.dra. Just select that folder and press open. And don't forget, all of these lessons are available for you on the blackmagicdesign.com website. So I highly recommend you take a look, download, and start to get your way onto the lessons plans here. Okay, so now that we've loaded our quick start guide, let's go ahead and double click on it and load it up. Now we're in our edit page and we want to be able to go into Fusion. So Place your playhead over the clip in your timeline that we want to work on and just go down to the bottom of the interface and click on the Fusion tab. And just like that, we're inside of our motion graphics and visual effects software. Resolve has automatically brought in the clip from the edit timeline, brought it in as the media in node for us and placed it in the node editor. So let's just take a moment to look at the inspector before we get involved too much in the nodes. At the top here, we have the interface toolbar. Now, this is a great way to open and close panels that we might need based on the type of workflow we're doing. The cool thing is that you can actually customize each of these panels, clicking and resizing them as needed. And for what we're doing today, we're going to go ahead and just clean this up and reset our workspace by going to the top here and clicking on workspace, and then going to reset UI layout. And that's going to bring us back to a standard uh, layout. And for the most part, it's going to be satisfactory for the type of work we're doing today. Uh, but I do want you to go back to the workspace and just take a look. Right above the Reset UI layout, there's Layout Presets. Now, what you can do is you can actually save your own custom layouts, which is great because as you're doing different types of workflows, you're going to want to have different panels open and available to you. So the fact that you can do that is really going to help your workflow. Okay, so below the interface toolbar, we have our viewers. We have a viewer on the left, viewer number one, and we have a viewer on the right, viewer number two. What's interesting about these viewers is that they're independent. And what I mean by that is if you're coming from a traditional NLE, you're going to have uh, two types of viewers. You're going to have your viewer on the left, which is your source viewer, like in the edit page. You're going to be able to click on a clip and load it to preview. And on the viewer on the right is usually traditionally your program monitor, right? That's the final output of your timeline. But in Fusion, each viewer is independent. So essentially, you can actually load your source or program in either one of the monitors. Each viewer is going to have a toolbar. You can do things like change the size, look at different channel selectors. And then below that, you're going to have our Timeline Ruler. This is where you will have all your playback controls. You can scrub the clip across time and place it on the exact frame that you want. You might have noticed that there's these ye little yellow bars. This is our auto render range. So when you hit the space bar, you can actually just preview just a section of the clip that you want to. Now, you're not changing the in and out points. It's just allowing you to basically RAM preview or cache preview just that portion of the clip. A quick tip is you can actually hold down the command key or control on a PC and then just click and drag and create your own render range. I'm going to go ahead and just reset that. Right click on the render range and click auto render range. Okay, so below that, we've got our node toolbar. And this is going to have the most commonly used nodes that you might use inside of Fusion available for us at any given moment. It's broken up into different categories. So we've got here image-based nodes and then followed by some color correction nodes. Then we have some compositing and transformation nodes, mask nodes, particle nodes, and 3D nodes. Now, I just want to talk about the word node and what it can mean. We can use the word node to describe a, a media clip, a source clip. In this case, the media in node is represented as the clip 
from the timeline, so it's an actual piece of media. But it can also mean a tool, like a transformation, a resizing or a rotation, as well as an effect, like maybe a blur or a, a lighting effect. So that word we can use uh, interchangeably between all those different types of medias. The next section that we're going to look at is the node editor, and that's this big section down here. This is where we're going to be doing all of our creating, all of our building. We're going to be bringing in nodes, connecting them together to create our visual effect or our composite. And as you're doing so, you're going to start to be able to add a lot of nodes and you're going to want to be able to move around and navigate. So how would we go about doing that? Well, if you have a three button mouse, I strongly suggest that we have a three button mouse. You can use the middle mouse button and then just click and move around, up or down, left or right. You can also hold down your command key and use the scroll wheel or control key on a PC. And as you can see, we can zoom in and out uh, of our node editor. Now, as I zoom in and out, you might see this little box up here. This is the auto navigator box, and that's just going to help you as we're building large node tree structures. It's going to help you to be able to navigate across your whole node tree, just like that. And as you zoom out, when, once you fully zoom out, it'll automatically go away. Okay, the same thing can work inside of the viewers as well. You can use your middle mouse button to move your viewer around. Also, zoom in using the scroll wheel and your command key or control key on a PC. And a quick tip is if you want to reset your viewer while you're in your viewer, you can press command F and that's going to auto fit our image based on the bounds of our viewer or control F on a PC. And lastly, we have our inspector over here on the right. And if you're familiar with the edit page or the other pages in Resolve, the inspector functions pretty much the same way. As you select a clip, say in the edit page, it will load that clip's properties in the inspector. And the same thing is true here. As we click on each node, it's going to load that node's properties in the inspector for us. And doing things traditionally like setting keyframes or adjusting parameters will feel very familiar if you're coming from the edit page. Okay, now that we've looked at the interface and we've got a good understanding of what each zone can potentially do, let's talk about nodes. So what do we have here? Right now we've got two nodes. We've got a media in node, and that's the node that's coming from the edit page. Again, if we click on the edit page, we can see that's the node that we that's the clip that we want to work on. Click back to the fusion page. This node, media in, is sending its signal, its RGB signal over to the media out node. The media out node is what sends our image that we've worked on back to resolve. So anything that we want to do to change or affect our clip needs to happen in between these two nodes. Now, how do we know if a node is connected or, or where it's going? Well, if we look at the media in node, it has this little square, this white square. That is our output. So every node will pretty much have a white square that will be able to output our image. And we connect it to a yellow triangle. That's our input image. And if we look at it, it kind of looks like it's an arrow. So that's telling us the flow. It's telling us the direction that it's going. We're going out from the media in node into the media out node. The next thing we might want to know is how do we know what we're viewing in the monitors, in our viewers? Well, if we take a look at this viewer on the right, right above it, you'll see it says media out one. That's letting us know that that node is loaded in this viewer. Now, if we go down to the media out node, we can see right here at the bottom, there's these two dots. Now, these are our uh, viewer dots. The one on the right is highlighted, letting us know that it's loading itself or sending itself to viewer two. So if we wanted to, we can view the media in node in viewer one. Select the node and then just go ahead and press the one key. And just like that, we've loaded that node in that viewer. Again, we can verify that by looking at the top of the viewer. It says media in one. And if we go back to the node in the node editor, we can see that now the left side, the left dot is highlighted. So it's telling us it's sending its signal. It's transmitting it to the viewer number one. Okay. 
So that's just a quick look at how nodes work, the basics in and out of each node. So the first thing that I want to do is just be organized and rename my nodes. So let's do that by right clicking on the media in node and going to rename. That's going to bring up our rename tool. I'm just going to name this actress. All right, I want to add just a simple color corrector. So to do that, let's go up to our node toolbar in our color correction section. If you leave your mouse over each icon, it'll give you a name label so you can find which node that you're looking for. When you find the color corrector node, just click and drag it right into our node editor. Now I'm hovering it over that image pipeline that we talked about earlier. And you might notice that now as I hover it over there, it's changed from yellow to yellow and blue. When it does that, you can go ahead and release your mouse. So now we've connected our first node, a color corrector node. I can verify that by just clicking and moving it up and down. We can see that it is connected. If we zoom in again, coming from the actress node, the output from this white square going into the yellow input, the yellow image input of our color corrector node, the color corrector node is going out from this white square into the yellow input of the media out node. Let's select our color corrector node. Let's go over to the inspector and I'm just going to make a, a big color corrector. We're not, we're not going to actually use this just so you can see what's going on here, specifically in our viewers. So when I made that change right away, the viewer on the right, you can see is completely changed. We can see the effects of what we just did. And that's because we're looking at the media out node, the final node in our pipeline. So it's going to see everything that happens before it. Now on the viewer on the left, viewer number one, we don't see any changes. And that's because, don't forget, we're looking at our actress node. And that's happening before the color corrector. So keep that in mind as you're viewing things, you might be making changes and not seeing it in one of your viewers. So that would probably be the case is the node order and how you're selecting and viewing each of those nodes. In essence, we are in a way previewing or soloing the actress uh, clip or actress node in viewer one. So that's why we don't see those changes. Okay, let's go ahead and select our color corrector. And in the inspector, we don't want to use this. So we're going to reset our node. If we go to the top right, you'll see a little circle with an arrow, the reset button. Just go ahead and click on that. And that's going to reset our whole node for us. And we're just going to do a quick little color correction. So in the range drop down menu, I'm going to go down to shadows. And I'm just going to kind of blue green the shadows and bring down the gamma. And then I'm going to go back up there to uh, the range drop down and click on midtones and do something very similar. Bring down the gamma as well. And back to the range drop down, go to highlights, and I'm just going to bring up the highlights. Again, we can always come back and make tweaks or adjustments as needed. The next thing that I want to do is uh, I want to add a vignette. So to do that, we're going to use two nodes. We're going to use a brightness contrast node and we're going to use a mask. So let's go back to our color correction section on our node toolbar, find the brightness contrast. Again, click and drag right over our image pipeline after our color corrector node. When you see it change to blue and yellow, go ahead and release your mouse. We can see that it's connected. I'm moving my node around. I can see that it's connected in the pipeline. And let's make our changes and adjustments. So in the inspector, I'm going to bring down the gain. I'm going to bring down the gamma as well. Great. I also want to bring down the saturation a little bit. But for whatever reason, let's just pretend that I made a change to the saturation and I don't like it. I want to be able to reset just that parameter. You can do so uh, if you've noticed Every time we've made a change, there's this little white reset button. It appears every time you make an adjustment. So just go ahead and click on that. And that's going to reset just that parameter for us. We don't want to reset the whole node and lose the changes that we've made. We just want to reset that one parameter. Uh, another quick way to do that is you can actually just double click on the name of that parameter and it will reset it as well. Okay. I'm going to just bring down the saturation a little bit. 
All right, we've uh, added our brightness contrast, we've changed and affected our image, it's not finished yet, we have to add our mask. We want to use a mask to control and isolate our brightness contrast node. So find the mask nodes in our node toolbar and find the ellipse one. I'm going to leave my mouse over there, you can see the name pops up. I'm just going to click and drag and bring that right into our node editor. Now I want to view this, so I'm going to view it in viewer one, pressing the number one key, and now we're viewing that mask. Now we've added a mask into the node editor, but nothing's happened. And that's because it's not connected. So just keep that in mind. You can add as many nodes as you want into the node editor, but you need to make sure that it's actually connected so that way it can affect the image pipeline. So let's do that. So far, we have been connecting our nodes with one connection, and that's this yellow triangle. Again, our background image input. Now there's another input, it's this blue triangle, and that's our effects mask input. And for the most part, pretty much every node will have a blue mask input. And we want to connect our circle mask or ellipse mask to this node. So to do that, let's drag and drop this output of our ellipse mask into the blue input of our brightness contrast mask. And right away, we can see the results in our viewer. Now, it's the wrong way, and that's fine. We can go ahead and fix and adjust that. So let's go to the inspector and find the invert checkbox and click on that. That's going to invert our mask for us. And the next thing we want to do is put this mask in its proper place, move it in the proper place we need to. So underneath the invert checkbox, you're going to see these center controls, X and Y. You can just click and drag inside of that text field and move your mask, Y axis or the X axis. Now, a great way is to do it in context on your viewer. If you hover your mouse over the center control point, you can see that as I hover it, it changes to white. Just click and drag, and now you can do that right inside of your viewer. I'm going to put it right there. All right, lastly, we want to change the size of our mask. So in the inspector, we can use the size slider controls, the width and the height. And the same thing is true for our viewers. We can use the on-screen controls directly in the viewer of our mask to change its size. Perfect. Lastly, let's just add a little bit of feathering to our mask and go to the soft edge parameter and just crank it all the way to the, to the top. Perfect. So let's just take a look at what we've done. I'm going to zoom out just a little bit. We've added our, our clip or our node from the edit page. That's represented by our actress node. Next, we've connected a color corrector clip to balance out our clip. Then we've added a brightness contrast and given it a, a mask to make a vignette. And that's sending its signal to the media out node. And if we go to the edit page, I'm going to use Shift F4. That's going to take us right back to the edit page. We can see all the results of our effects right here for us. And that's something that's actually really special. The ability to just click a button and work at the speed of your creativity is a powerful way to work. Just like that, we can come back, look at our edit, make sure it's working, make sure the playback of the other clips around it are, are working as well. So let's go back to our clip. Shift 5 will take us right back into Fusion. All right, up to this point, we've been affecting our image, uh, adding effects to it, but now we're ready to do some compositing. So we want to bring in uh, some new clips and composite them on top of our actress clip. So to do that, let's go ahead and click on the media pool tab, again, at the top uh, of our interface toolbar. Now, this is the same media pool that's available in all the other uh, pages in Resolve. So all the clips that you have available to you on the edit page or the cut page are all available right here. Let's find our HUD animation. When you do, just click and drag bring it right into our node editor. I'm going to close down the media pool. All right, the first thing we should do is uh, rename our node. And instead of right clicking, this time I'm going to hit F2. And that's going to bring up the rename tool dialog box. And let's just rename this HUD. Next, I want to view it in viewer one. So press the number one key and it's going to load that node into viewer one. Uh, if you're familiar with any type of compositing application, you'll recognize that we've got a checkered box background. That's letting us know that this has an alpha channel. We can verify that by going up to the uh, channel selector tool and looking at our alpha channel. 
And yes, it does have an alpha channel. I'm gonna go back to the color. All right, now we want to take this layer, if you will, this node, and composite it on top of our actress. So how would we go about doing that? Well, we're going to go about doing that using the merge node. So in our composite and transform node toolbar, find the merge node, click, and let's, like we've done before, drag it over our image pipeline after our brightness contrast. When we see it changed to blue and yellow, go ahead and release your mouse. And now we've added a merge node. Let's take a little look at that. We're familiar with our yellow triangle input. That's our background image input. We're familiar with our blue triangle input. That's our effects mask input. But now we have a green input, and that's our foreground input. And really, think of it that way. We want to have a foreground element, right? In this case, our HUD animation. And we want to add it on top of, or composite it on top of, our background, which is our actress. Another way you can look at it is think of the yellow triangle as track one on the edit page and the green triangle as track two on the edit page. So it's just stacking them one on top of the other. So let's make our first composite, take the output of our HUD, this little white square, and connect it to the green triangle input of our merge node. And when we do, we can now see the effects of our composite. We have our HUD on top of our actress. I'm going to zoom in, or excuse me, zoom out a little bit and move this over. Let's repeat that process again and add a different layer. Go back to the media pool, find the glass JPEG image, and then let's just drag that right in. I'm going to close my media pool. With that node selected, press 1, load it in viewer 1, press F2 to rename it. And uh, just so you know, as I'm looking at this in the viewer, I see our image and it has a, a completely black background. I'm assuming that it doesn't have an alpha channel. I'm going to verify that just by clicking on our channel selector. And yeah, it doesn't have an alpha channel. So just so you know, once we composite that, it's going to completely cover our, uh, the, our background image. And that's fine. We can fix it. We can adjust it. So let's make our composite again. We're going to use a merge node. Click and drag our merge node drag it over our image pipeline. When it changes to blue and yellow, release. Take the output of our glass node, connect it to the green triangle input of our merge two. And just like we talked about, now we've composited that, but again, it's covering up our image. That's fine. With that merge node selected, let's go into the inspector. And uh, under the apply mode, you'll see there's a drop down box that's got all the available composite modes that you're familiar uh, when you've been compositing. So we're going to use and click on screen. Next, I'm going to go to this blend parameter right here, and that's essentially the opacity control. So I'm just going to bring it down just ever so slightly. We have brought our clip in from our timeline, our actress layer. We've added some color correction, and we've done two composites uh, with our HUD and with our glass. The one thing that I did notice earlier was that I thought that the HUD layer had a little bit larger resolution. So I'm going to just load it into viewer one. And we can see that we definitely have more information here that's not showing up on our final composite. And that's fine. We can just use a transform node to rescale it down for us. But that brings up an interesting question, and that's node order. Again, where we connect and place our nodes will have an impact on our final image. So let's just take a look at what happens if we were to add a transform node at the very end of our uh, node tree. So go to, go to the node toolbar and just find our transform node. Just click it and drag it again right over our image pipeline after our merge two. And when we go to the inspector, we're going to adjust its size. Okay, so that's not what we wanted. Uh, this transform is actually affecting everything that happened before it. In this case, it's sizing down our actress and our HUD and our glass layer all together, and that's, that's not what we want. So we need to think about what's the most efficient way to place our nodes, to insert our nodes, so that it's only affecting our HUD. Well, first of all, let's go ahead and delete this transform node. Just make sure it's selected and press your delete key. And I'm thinking that if we place our transform node right after our HUD node, that that's only going to affect 
our HUD node. So let's give that a try. Again, go ahead and grab our transform node and then just bring it in and connect it to our HUD pipeline. Okay, so now it's connected. Let's go back to our inspector and in the size parameter, let's resize it. And of course, so now it's affecting just the HUD. So keep that in mind as you're working, as you're adding nodes, where you place your nodes will have an impact on the final outcome. In this case, we only want to isolate and transform the HUD. So make sure that you place the node in the right spot. All right, I'm going to use the on-screen controls here and just move this HUD over just a little bit. Perfect. Let's just go ahead and add some look effects nodes just to kind of dial in our HUD layer so it starts to feel a little bit more like it's a part of the scene. So to do that, I'm going to go to the effects library. Now, for the most part, we've been adding our nodes from the node toolbar. And again, those are the commonly used tools that you're going to need access to right there in the toolbar. But in the effects library, it has all of the nodes available inside of Fusion. So they're broken up for you on different categories for 3D, blurs, you name it. Take a look at each of these different categories for you. Each of these different categories based on what you need for your composite. We're going to be in the blur category and we're going to use the defocus node. But before we add that, I want to do it a little bit differently. So I'm going to go over here and just make a little room by dragging these nodes up. And with my transform node selected, just go to the uh, defocus plugin and just click on that node and watch what happens. Because we had our transform node selected, and when we clicked on the defocus node, Fusion said, I think you want to add it automatically and I'll connect it for you. And that's exactly what we want. So just by having this node selected and then clicking on this icon in the effects library, it'll just add it for you and connect it for you automatically. In the defocus node in the inspector, let's go to the bloom level and let's just bring it down. We don't want it to be too bright, so we're just going to bring that down. Now, not only do you have all of Fusion's tools available for you, but because we're inside of DaVinci Resolve, you also have access to the Resolve effects that you can use in the edit page and the color page that are now available inside of Fusion. So let's open our open effects category and go down to the effects stylize. Now again, remember I have my defocus node selected, so I'm going to go over here and click on prism blur. And when I do, it's just going to automatically add it for me. Uh, right below that is uh, scan lines. Let's go ahead and just click on scan lines as well. Okay, I'm going to close down the effects library. Again, I'm going to alter my, my UI and just rearrange some of these notes just to make it a little bit easier for us to look at. We've added our defocus, we've added a prism blur, and we've added some scan lines. With the scan lines selected, I just want to bring up the line frequency here in the inspector under appearance. You can see this line frequency. I'm just going to bring it up to somewhere around 11 is fine. But as we're doing that, I'm noticing something, and that is we applied our blur and we applied our prism blur. After that, we applied the scan lines. And what's happening is that the scan lines are cutting through our blur effect and it's not feeling natural or real. So this, again, make sure you're paying attention to your node connection order. That's very, very important. So what we want to do is we want to take our scan lines node and remove it and put it before our blurred nodes. So let's look at how we can do that. Now, earlier, when we had a node that we didn't want, we selected it and deleted it. Now, there's a faster way of doing that. And that is if you hold down the shift key and then click and drag your node, you can instantly remove it out of that pipeline, keeping that pipeline intact, but then moving that node out of it. And we want to drag it before and connect it before our defocus. So I'm going to rearrange some of these nodes here. Again, click and hold and drag on my scan lines and hold the shift key down. And when I hover over it, we can see it changes to half yellow, half blue. When it does, release your mouse, and now it's connected again. So these little tidbits like this are great for being efficient as you work inside of Fusion. 
Okay, so now I'm looking at my output and I can see now the order is correct. First, we're applying our scan lines, then we're applying our defocus, and then after that, we're applying our prism blur. And that's exactly how it should look. But now that we've done that, I can see my glass node is looking very, very sharp. And it's not the same. If the HUD and the glass are supposed to be on the same plane, you know, we need to apply those same effects that we did earlier on the HUD onto the glass. There's a couple ways we can do that, but one of the simplest ways we can is just selecting our defocus node and using Command C for copy or Control C if you're on a PC. Copy that, select our glass node, and then just paste it. Command V or Control V to paste. And we've made a copy, a duplicate of that node, and we've just pasted it into the pipeline for our glass node. All the same settings, all the same right there for us. I'm gonna do the same thing for our prism blur. Command C, copy, select our defocus, and then paste it right in. So we haven't done any playback, but we can play this back and see all of our effects in context as we're working. Shift 4 will take us back to the edit page. We can see our progress of our effect on our clip, and we can watch it back in context, add some sound effects, add some music. There's a lot of power in being able to quickly move between each page and see your edit in context and your visual effects in context. All right, let's go back to the Fusion page with Shift 5. In context, our actress is waking up and an emergency is happening and really there should be uh, some sort of warning text or warning light that's flashing and that's what we want to create. We want to be able to add a little text that's warning her and saying something is wrong. So let's look at how we could do that. To do that, first we need to add a text node. So let's go over here to our image generation nodes and just click and drag and bring our text node into the node editor. I'm going to press the number one key and load it in viewer one so we can see its results. Again, nothing's happened because we haven't connected our nodes and we haven't written any text. So let's go to the inspector and let's type in warning. All right. So the idea is I want to be able to connect my text node into my composite but essentially it's a part of the HUD. So I would like it to have all the same effects that we've applied to our HUD to apply to the text node. So again, this is very important about node order. Where you place your nodes is very, very important. So let's just, for uh, the sake of looking at this, add our text node, merge our text node into our composite. Now, before we've been grabbing our merge from our toolbar and bringing that down into our node editor, but this time we're gonna do it a little different way. Let's take the output of our text node and connect it to the output of our merge 2. And when we did that, Fusion is saying, well, it looks like you want to composite. You're taking the output of one node and you're placing it over the output of another node. So I'm going to assume that you want me to composite these or merge them together. So I'm going to add a merge node and connect everything for you. And that's exactly what we want. As we added this, we've added this node, this text node, to the end of our node tree and it's nice, crisp, and sharp, and it doesn't have those same effects that we have on our HUD. So we can copy and paste those nodes like we did for the glass layer, but then it comes into the issue of having multiple duplicates of these different effects nodes and managing each one, and as you change one, making sure you do it to the other. So there's a, an efficient way, there's a smart way to think about this, and if we think about it, we can actually place our text node in a way that it just inherits all of those effects that we've already done. So let's go ahead and delete our merge. We don't need that anymore. And let's take our text node and move it over here next to our HUD layer. I'm going to move this HUD and transform node up. And if we connect this node and insert it at this point, it should just inherit all of those effects that we've done. So let's give that a try. Take the output of our text node and then just drag it over the output of our transform node. Again, Fusion just created the merge for us. And as we can see in our viewer, in viewer two, that now it's actually taking on the effects that we've added to the HUD, scan lines, defocus, and prism blur. So thinking about where you place your nodes, you can actually be smart and efficient about how you use your nodes. 
If you're familiar with using um, layer-based applications, this is the same thing as doing a pre-comp. The benefit is you're not doing a compound clip or you're not losing access to all your layers. Everything is still right here available for you to quickly access and change. Let's just change this text node around a little bit. Select the text node and in the inspector, let's go ahead and change our font to from bold to just regular. And let's bring up our size a little bit. And I want to move this more closer to her, to the HUD and to her eyes. All right. Now you might have noticed that there's all these different tabs up here. And like I said earlier, when you click on a node, each node is going to have a different set amount of parameters. And in this case, the text node has a lot of different parameters. For our purposes, we want to be in the shadings tab. So let's go down to the color and let's just change this to somewhat of a red. Now you might have noticed up here this select elements. So you've got different shading elements up to eight. And it, essentially that allows you to do things like drop shadows or glows or blurs or outlines. So what we can do is we can select shading element number two that's going to give us a red outline. Now this name here, this is a custom name. We can change this to whatever we want. Like orange glow, for example. Now nothing has happened because we need to activate it. We need to, need to enable it. So click the enabled checkbox. And now you can see like in viewer one, I'm going to go ahead and zoom in on viewer one, command scroll wheel to see the its changes. Now you can see we've added this outline. I'm going to use the color just for example, we can see it being changed as we're changing the color. And we can change the thickness, go through and adjust, adjust different parameters. But for our purposes, I'm just going to make it this semi orange and red color. Okay, let's go to the softness. And let's increase the softness on the X and on the Y. Maybe even give it a little bit of a glow. Perfect. So we've added our text. We've inserted it uh, in between the HUD and the effects for it. And now we've got this warning sign happening in front of our actress. If we play back, we can see, well, it's just static. So we really would need it to be flashing on and off or uh, coming on and off, letting her know, getting her attention. So we're going to do that by using the merge node. And if I just scrub the blend parameter, again, it's also the opacity parameter. If I just scrub that back and forth, you can see that's kind of the effect that we want to do. So let's go ahead and look at how we can animate this in order to get it to flash on and off. Uh, I'm going to hit the command left arrow, and that's going to take me back to the beginning of my clip. You can also hit command right arrow, and that'll take you to the end. In this case, we want to start our animation at the beginning of our clip. So command left arrow to go to the beginning. And uh, if you're familiar with using the inspector on the edit page, then it's very similar to here in the fusion page. To the right of our parameter, you might have seen these little white diamonds. And that's our keyframe button. Now with our playhead in the right frame that we want to be on, and uh, with our blend parameter, we can just click on that checkbox and that's going to activate a keyframe. We can see it's changed to orange now. We know we've added a keyframe. Also, you can tell on the node editor on the merge three that there's an icon for a uh, keyframe. That's letting us know that that node also has keyframes. Okay, let's take down our blend all the way down to zero. I want to move forward 10 frames so that way I can set my new keyframe. Now I'm going to do it a little bit different. I'm going to go to the text, uh, text field here of our timeline ruler. It's right here on the right side, the bottom right below the timeline ruler. Just change this from 12 to 2. I'm going to manually type that in. And when I hit enter, that's just going to move my playhead forward 10 frames exactly. We're going to frame 22. Now in the blend parameter, I'm just going to click and drag that back to one. And as you can see, it automatically gave us a, a keyframe because we had one set previously. So when we made an adjustment, it just set a keyframe right away for us. Let's do the same thing again. Let's move forward 10 more frames. I'm just going to change that and manually change it from 22 to 32. 
We just move forward again 10 frames, and I'm going to drag this parameter of the blend right back down to zero. So essentially, we've animated our warning light to come on and off. So let's take a look at that. Command left arrow takes us to the beginning, hit the space bar, and there we go. It's pretty much just like we talked about. I'm going to just drag this uh, auto render range bar right over here just so we can play this back. Okay, that's not bad. That's getting us where we need to be. But really, it would be great if we had our warning sign come on more like a, a flash, right? Just hard coming on instead of a soft transition from linear, you know, from zero to one and back down to zero. So how would we go about just making those keyframes that we've set, making them come on, uh, pop on? We can do that if we use the spline editor. So up here in the uh, interface toolbar, you might see our spline editor. Go ahead and click on that. I'm going to stop playback as well. I'm going to put my playhead right here in the time ruler on the center keyframe at frame 22. And if we take a look at the spline editor, it's pretty much broken up into two sections. We have the section on the left, which is anything that's got a keyframe on it, any type of node that's got a keyframe will be available to us right here on this side. And on the right is our graph. So what we do is we activate or turn on our effect. And in this case, we animated the blend. And when we click that checkbox, now that keyframe of those splines are available for us to look at and manipulate right here in the spline graph editor. And don't forget, you can also do the same navigational tools that we used earlier to move around, pressing the middle mouse button to move the spline editor, holding down the command or the control key, and using the scroll wheel to zoom in and out. All work right here inside of the spline editor. As I move the playhead around, you can see that we're animating linearly from 0 to 1 over time and then back to 0. What we want to do is we want to be able to find a way to hold our keyframes so that way our image pops on and then turns off, on and off. And we can do that if we select all of these keyframes. Just drag a selection box right around these keyframes. And at the bottom of this spline editor, you might have noticed all these different icons. These are spline editable icons that allow us to manipulate and change our splines and our keyframes for different values. Now, the one thing that we want is we want the step in icon. So once you put your mouse over the step in icon, go ahead and click on that. And you can see visually the change that has happened to that spline now. It's no longer gradually moving over time to each keyframe. It's now got a hard hold keyframe, so it's going to pop on and off. So let's take a look at that. I'm going to hit my space bar. And we can see that's exactly what it's doing now. Warning is just popping on and popping off. Okay, that's looking better. The next thing that we need to do, though, is we need to essentially add keyframes to have this effect happen repeatedly over time until the end of the clip. So we could copy and paste keyframes uh, or just manually go through and animate like we did. But again, we want to work dynamically. We want to be able to work in a way that allows us to use the least amount of keyframes but give us the most impact. So we're going to do that again by selecting all of our keyframes like we did before. And again, at the bottom here, let's find the set loop icon. It's the icon with two little squiggly lines. Once you find that, go ahead and click on that icon. And right away, you can see now we have this sort of dotted line pattern that's mimicking our keyframes, our original three keyframes that we set. And this is a great way to work and build animations just based off of three keyframes. So I'm going to open up my auto render range back this way so we can see the full effect and hit spacebar. So again, just by making three keyframes, now we've animated that over the entire length of the clip, doing that same process over and over again. And to take it even a step further, what we can do is we can actually uh, select our keyframes and use this icon down here that's called shape box. If we click it, it's going to make a shape box around those keyframes that we can use to warp those keyframes. Or in our case, we want to be able to compress the timing of our keyframes. So just by dragging the shape box, we can actually compress the timing. But in doing so, it's dynamically updating our loop. And now it's animating on 
and off much faster. So again, thinking in, in a way that we can animate dynamically so we can do complex things, but in a simple way. Okay, that is looking pretty good. I'm going to close down my spline editor and zoom out a little bit just so we can see all of our node tree structure. The last thing that I want to talk about is just furthering this idea of dynamic animation and could we take that further? And we can. Uh, it would be nice if maybe as this warning light is popping on and off on our actress that we could have a little bit of a light glow uh, appearing on her face. So we're going to do that, but we're going to do that without adding any more keyframes than we already have. So let's go back to the beginning of our no tree. And I'm just going to move these two keyframes, excuse me, move these two nodes over just to create a little bit of space. And let's zoom in a little bit. Essentially, I'm going to create this lighting effect by using another color corrector node. So with my color corrector node selected, I don't want to use the toolbar or I don't want to use the effects library. I want to do this in a much faster way. So, and there is, we can use shift spacebar and that's going to bring up our select tool dialog box. As you get to know uh, each and every of the nodes that are available to you, you can now just bring up this dialog box and type in its name and quickly be able to find, access, and add a node to your, to your node tree very, very quickly. So in this case, I'm just going to type in CC and that's going to find and select my color corrector node. And when I hit enter, just like that, it's added it straight away after the node that I had selected. And so one thing I want you to be aware of is as you're building your nodes, we can add as many nodes as we need. But in this case, if I had to send this comp to someone else or maybe even myself come back later, I might see color corrector one and color corrector two, and maybe I forget which node is doing which. So it's important that we take the time to label these nodes. Uh, in this case, I'm going to select both of those nodes together. And then, like we've done before, I'm going to hit F2 to bring up the rename tool. It's brought up color corrector one. I'm going to type in base underscore CC. And when I hit enter, it's going to bring up the rename tool again. So because I had both of those nodes selected at once, when I hit the rename tool, it's going to automatically bring up the rename tool for me, essentially renaming my nodes in bulk. So let's go ahead and rename this. red light underscore CC. All right, so let's select our red light color corrector node and let's go over to the inspector and just change it towards red. And that's uh, that can work for the most part. We want to be able to isolate it again like we did before on the brightness contrast node. So we're going to do that same procedure of adding an ellipse node and controlling our uh, color corrector node. But we're going to use the new way of adding a node, and that is shift spacebar right away, just typing in ellipse, hitting enter. And very, very quickly, you can see how now, because we know our nodes, we can add to tools and we can add nodes very, very fast. Okay. We've added our ellipse node. I'm going to use the on-screen controls, adjust the node into position where I think it should fit best. Right around there is good. Now, uh, normally I would just go ahead and soften the edge right away, but I want to leave this as a hard edge for now, just so we can see our effect. And then once we're done, we'll come back and soften that off. Okay, so earlier I said we're going to animate this effect without adding any keyframes. And we're going to do that by using what Fusion calls modifiers. Now a modifier is a really cool way of being able to link two different parameters even across different nodes to drive animation dynamically. So uh, let's look at how we can do that. In the inspector under the strength parameter essentially if I just click and drag in the text field I'm just rough animating this myself but that's the effect that we want and we want to do that same effect of turning our strength parameter on and off based on the same timing of our keyframes we set for our warning light. So if we just right click on the strength parameter and we go down to modify width, there's a lot of different options for us to use, but in our case, we want to use the probe modifier. So let's click on the probe modifier. Well, what, what happened? We clicked on the probe modifier, our effect went away, and really nothing else happened. 
Uh, well, you can verify that we've added the probe modifier by seeing our uh, checkbox here next to our color wheel has turned orange. And also our node in the node editor now has a keyframe icon. So we've know, we know we know that we've added something. If we go to our inspector at the very, very top of the inspector, you'll see that there's a tools tab and a modifiers tab. Now, up to this point, that modifiers tab has been grayed out because we didn't have any modifiers in there. But now that we've added one, we can click in that tab and see our modifiers. So let's go ahead and click on that tab. And there you go. We can see our probe modifier. And essentially, what is a probe modifier? Well, a probe modifier is a way to inspect or probe another image uh, and use that image data to drive the effects of another parameter. So we've added a probe modifier. Now we need to tell it which node or which image to look at. There's nothing to look at. We can verify that by looking at the image to probe in this little uh, text field, it's empty. So there's nothing there. We have to tell that. We have to tell that probe modifier, hey, I want you to look at this specific node. So let's go over to our merge three. This is where we have our animation uh, for our text animation. Now let's just click and drag and keep dragging and going all the way into the probe modifier dialog box. I know it might seem a little weird to be able to drag a node all the way from the node editor into the inspector, but just go all the way and let go and you'll see it. Now it says merge three. So now we're, now we've connected our probe to a merge, but again, nothing is happening. And that's because we have to now move our center control for our probe, right? We added a probe modifier. The probe actually has a probe, which is this center position. And when we move this over our text, we can see that now it gets activated. Now we can pull this image and I'm just going to use my viewer one. And you can see here as I move this probe over the text. Now, when we hit play, the animation of our text layer is now driving the strength parameter of our color corrector. So now this animation is happening in sync together, just like that. And again, just using our original three keyframes, thinking dynamically and creating complex things uh, in a simple way. Remember we talked about our ellipse mask. We're going to go back right now and change that to a soft edge. So select your ellipse mask and then go back to the inspector and then let's just soften this up. Cool. I'm going to deselect everything in the node editor and you can see that we're playing our clip. Our text animation is coming on and off and uh, our cool little lighting effect is in sync with that animation just like that. Let's just take a zoom out and look at everything that we've done. We've added our actress from our edit page. We've given ourselves some color correction, a vignette. We've gone through and actually composited two different layers, our glass layer and our HUD layer. And lastly, we added a cool little lighting effect using a modifier. So as you can see here, a lot of times we start to add a bunch of nodes as we're building and as we're creating. And it's going to be good if you know that there's a couple ways that we can organize our node editor and keep things a little bit cleaner and easier to come back to later. So let's take a look at that. If I just select these nodes here, which is all the nodes associated with my glass layer. I'm just going to move them over a little bit and give a little room. But if I select all of these, I'm going to use our keyboard shortcut of shift spacebar, bring up our select tool dialog box, and I'm going to add what's called an underlay. And just like that, an underlay is a great way to group some nodes together, but we're not collapsing them. We're not um, compound clipping them. They're all still available for us to look at and work on. Um, but what the cool thing is that it actually is as if it was a group. So we can move this underlay around and all of our nodes associated inside of that underlay will move with it. So let's go ahead and rename it and give it its own color. I'm going to deselect by clicking in uh, the node editor and then option click on the underlay, hit F2, and then let's just name this glass effects. And then let's just right click right there on the name and go down to set color and give it a color of pink. And let's move down our node 
tree here and just do the same process. Select these nodes all associated with the HUD layer. Shift spacebar. Again, type in underlay. And I'm going to adjust the size parameter of our underlay. Deselect it by clicking out of the, into the no, uh, node editor. And then just option clicking on the name, hitting F2. And let's rename it HUD underscore effects. We can right click again on its name and go to set color and let's give it navy blue. And I'm just going to highlight these two nodes, bring them over, shift spacebar, type in underlay. And to be honest, I'm not even typing the full word. If you notice, I'm just typing U and N. And Fusion's automatically trying to find the node that you're thinking of and giving you options. So underlay is right there. Hit enter. I'm going to adjust the size of this, bringing it up deselecting it, option click F2, and I'm just going to say source. And we can change its color as well. So right away, we can start to visually see what's happening here. We're grouping our nodes based on the type of effect that it's happening. So if I were to pass this comp on to another person, they can quickly be able to look at my node structure and get a sense right away what's happening and where I have placed things. But even a more important thing is if you know that we're zoomed in on, let's say, a couple of nodes here we're working, uh, we want to be able to move around. We can use our auto navigation tool that pops up right here. But we can also use our underlays as, as bookmarks, if you will. So in this little three-dot menu here of our node editor, if you click on it, you'll see that all of our underlays are now available for us as essentially bookmarks. So we can just click on these and quickly jump to each one as needed. Pretty cool little way of staying organized. As well as that, we can right-click anywhere in our node editor. And there's a lot of different ways of organizing and setting up our nodes that you have the option to use. So for example, force source tile pictures. That's just going to make all of our source images, like for example, our HUD and our glass effects, our text layers, etc large tiles. So it makes it easier. So little things like this to help yourself uh, stay organized and be able to navigate around in your node editor are very, very helpful. So definitely explore by right clicking and looking at ways to arrange your tools, lining everything up to a grid, etc. Okay, don't forget Shift 4. The power of just one keystroke going back and forth between editorial and motion graphics and visual effects right here in context of your edit. I hope that you can see the power in being able to move quickly between each of these pages. Seeing your visual effects in context of your editor really is a powerful, powerful feature that's going to help you work faster and actually be more creative. So I really hope that what we've seen today uh, makes sense and that you can actually start to build your own composites and visual effects. Don't forget to go to blackmagicdesign.com, take a look at all the different training materials, download the lessons plans, and find ways that you can become certified in each of the pages for Resolve. If you have any questions, don't forget to go to the Blackmagic forums to find out any questions that you might have. Thanks for watching today. Take what you've learned and make it better.